Have you ever tried repairing your phone? Well, it's not that easy and phone manufacturers want to discourage us from doing so by any means. Why is that? Also on the show, do you let AI do your work for you yet? We'll show you tools to boost your productivity. And we look at Elon Musk's satellite internet network Starlink and how it affects world politics. These are the topics that are moving the tech world. Have you ever fixed your broken smartphone? Chances are you bought a new one instead. Repairing a phone is difficult and that's a problem. We produce more than 50 million metric tons of e-waste globally each year. That's the equivalent to throwing out a thousand laptops every single second. And still, tech companies make it hard and expensive to repair broken devices. At the forefront of this unsustainable strategy, smartphone manufacturers. Plant obsolescence. So why can't you easily change your smartphone's battery? Because the manufacturer doesn't want you to. And it doesn't stop there. Many companies offer very limited support when it comes to security and software updates after three to four years. And solutions for outdated hardware are pretty much non-existent. That's intentional. In the United States, for example, an average smartphone only lasts between two and three years. Which means big bucks for smartphone manufacturers, as you always have to buy a new phone. On top of that, even simple smartphone fixes are very hard to do for non-experts. And having it done by a registered service might cost a fortune, because the manufacturers even cash in on the repair bill. Cashing in on repairs. Apple's new iPhone 15 is a perfect example of how to make it very complicated and costly for users to fix their own phones. It all works through software locks. The phone system recognizes if parts are replaced with new ones that didn't come from Apple. The phone will then display a warning message or functionality will be lost completely. Apple says they want to guarantee that their devices work perfectly. But if you ask me, this is probably about selling expensive spare parts. Costly repairs are likely to drive users to get a new device. This means more devices need to be made and shipped, increasing the mining of and wasting more resources. That adds to carbon pollution and produces even more electronic waste. E-waste contains a large number of hazardous substances like cadmium, lead, mercury and dioxins, but also valuable materials like gold and rare earth, which often go to waste. How do manufacturers justify that? The environmental benefits of repairability are obvious. In the past, various initiatives have been trying to persuade companies like Apple, Microsoft and Amazon to commit to more sustainable product strategies. Instead, Big Tech has spent millions of dollars convincing lawmakers not to support repairability laws. They cite a range of reasons for their opposition. For one, a right to repair would infringe on their intellectual property rights, they say. Another concern, consumer safety. What if people injure themselves fixing their stuff? Companies also claim to be deeply concerned that independent repair will lead to more hacking. And last but not least, shoddy repairs could damage companies' reputations. Sound like valid points to you? Well, repair advocates have deemed these arguments baseless and argue the manufacturers are mainly worried repairability will hurt their turnovers. What is being done? In spite of big tech's extensive lobbying, there are actions being taken by governments. The European Parliament has recently voted for a right to repair. Under the new law, sellers as well as manufacturers are obligated to offer free repairs within the warranty period. In the US state of California, an Electronics Right to Repair Act was already passed. It guarantees everyone access to parts, tools and manuals needed to fix their electronic devices. The goal? Reducing waste and carbon emissions. These efforts sound promising, but to force device manufacturers to end their unsustainable business strategies, we probably need international solutions. 
In case you want to take on the challenge to repair your phone, iFixit.com offers a lot of step-by-step -step explanations of how you can save your gadget. Would you rather fix your phone yourself instead of getting a new one? Let us know. Which of these emails are urgent? Come on, another meeting? And I still need to send out those reminders. How can I get some work done? Do you feel like that sometimes? Let AI come to your rescue. It can help you boost your productivity at work, reach your goals, and, as a recent study suggests, even help you get a day off to have more time for yourself. So what exactly can AI do for you? Manage your time. Tools like Sanebox or Spark use AI to analyze your inbox. Your emails are then prioritized based on importance. This way, you're not missing anything and don't have to stress about messages that are not that urgent. AI assistants can even send automated responses for you. Same goes for scheduling. AI can help you get the most out of your working hours. Based on your work pattern or the importance of your tasks, tools like AnyDo can suggest an optimal schedule. Also, AI can help you and your colleagues find a suitable meeting spot, send invites or provide relevant documents. Analyzing data. AI can analyze data sets quicker than any human could. Tools like Tableau also visualize findings for you. Businesses working with a lot of data might benefit from this. The tools could help identify problems or unused potential. This might give you an edge in fields like finance or research. Personalize learning. To really excel at your job, you constantly have to improve your skills. AI-powered learning platforms like edX can help you with that. They can create personalized training programs based on your skills and weaknesses and provide you with individualized feedback. Keep in mind that such tools often come with a price tag. Plus, there are many more out there than the ones I mentioned. So do your own research to find the products that suit your needs. All right. Now I can become a superhuman at work, but what about getting that day off we mentioned earlier? Well, two studies conducted in Britain and the US suggested that AI might enable millions of people to move to a four-day work week by 2033. In concrete numbers, AI could reduce the work week from 40 to 32 hours for 28% of the workforce. That's 8.8 .8 million people in Britain and 35 million in the US. But if companies will give their workers full pay for working less, that's another story. One idea to ensure workers are not losing out on money due to AI is Universal Basic Income or UBI. This means that everyone would regularly get an unconditional minimal income. But where would the money be coming from? Well, some experts suggest taxing companies on the profits they make by using AI. Others go even further and say everyone should have the right to UBI because we collectively created all the data that's being used to train AIs. However, universal basic income is still subject to much debate and won't be coming anytime soon. But it's an interesting concept if you ask me. Are you already using AI in your everyday work? Let us know. Elon Musk is failing big time with Twitter, uh, X, but another plan of his seems to be working. To establish a world-spanning satellite internet network called Starlink. With this service provided by his company SpaceX, Musk can grant or take away internet access. He recently offered Starlink services to eight organizations in Gaza. And he provided people in Iran with internet. Do we want a private investor like Musk to have that much power? Here are some examples of what Musk does with his satellites. Internet or no internet for Ukraine. The internet plays a crucial role in the Ukraine war. Military, government, humanitarian organizations and citizens heavily depend on it. In 2022, Ukrainian internet and communication networks were compromised during the Russian invasion. Musk Starlink stepped in and provided Ukraine with internet services. Ukrainians use the internet to defend themselves, but also to attack Russian positions. But when Ukrainian military targeted Russian forces outside Ukrainian borders, Musk disapproved. 
and limited Starlink services in these regions. For this, he was strongly criticized by Ukraine. Elon Musk seems to like getting involved in world politics. Internet for aid organizations in Gaza. Just recently, Musk created another controversy by offering Starlink services to internationally recognized aid organizations in Gaza. In the wake of the terrorist attack by Hamas, classified by multiple countries as a terrorist organization, and Israel's response, telephone and internet blackouts isolated people in the Gaza Strip. So far, Starlink hasn't provided information on how they want to make sure only humanitarian organizations access their services. Israel considers Musk's initiative a clear pro-Palestine move. Free access to information in Iran. Free internet via Starlink can pose a big threat for governments in authoritarian countries like Iran. Iran is heavily regulating domestic networks, at times with complete internet shutdowns. But during the massive civilian protests in 2022, Starlink positioned about 100 of their satellites over Iran, making it very difficult for the government to control the flow of information. But why is satellite internet hard to control? Let's say you did a Google search via satellite internet your request would be beamed up into space. A satellite then receives the data and relays it back to Earth, from where it can be sent to its intended recipient, in this case, a Google server. The information then gets back to you the same way. This way, governments have little to no control over internet traffic, because the traffic does not pass through any domestic communication infrastructure. So far, satellite internet was mostly pretty slow though. The traffic has to travel long distances. But with Starlink, Musk has developed a new fleet of interconnected satellites much closer to Earth. Those are supposed to make connections much faster. Is it fair for a private player to be able to grant or take away internet access? Who, if anyone, should have that sort of power? We'd love to hear your opinion. That's all from me today. Bye and see you next time.